Good afternoon and welcome to the 2015 Disabled American Veterans Distinguished Speaker Lecture. My name is Daniel Nagan. I'm faculty director of the Legal Services Center of Harvard Law School and its Veterans Legal Clinic. A couple of very brief notes at the outset. We will have a question and answer segment to the event towards the end. Uh, microphones will be passed around, um, so please hold on to any questions until the uh, second uh, part of uh, this afternoon's event. Um, for now, I am very, very pleased to invite to the podium Martha Minow, the Morgan and Helen Chu Dean and Professor of Law, who will provide words of welcome and introduce our distinguished speaker, uh, Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mavis. Well, thank you, Dan, and I just first have to thank Dan for his outstanding leadership here. When I was trying to recruit Dan to come here, he said, I, I can't come unless I can start a veterans clinic. Um, it wasn't too hard to sell, but I cannot tell you what a great uh, leader and, uh, and collaborator uh, Dan is. Recently promoted to be the head of all um, clinics and experiential learning opportunities here. So on behalf of the law school, uh, and our Armed Forces Association, a truly uh, outstanding group of individuals, and our Veterans Legal Clinic, I just am very honored to welcome you all to this special event. We are thrilled that our speaker today, are in this second of our Disabled American Veterans Distinguished Speakers uh, Lecture, is the outstanding Secretary Mabus. And I'm more on you later, okay? But first I have a few other things to say. The Disabled American Veterans uh, Charitable Service Trust, whose support for our work on behalf of veterans uh, is just a, a terrific partner. We're very, very honored uh, to be able to work alongside uh, these people and their commitment to raising awareness about the needs of our nation's disabled veterans is truly an example that is crucial and inspiring to us all. And this lecture series is very much in that spirit to help us shine a spotlight on the challenges we face and the opportunities we have in meeting the needs of those who have worn their uniforms. The goal is to inspire not only discussion, however, we are interested in action and action to meet the challenges and to hold up what is a sacred trust that we enter into when we ask men and women to take up arms on behalf of this nation. And to do this, the DAV Distinguished Speaker Series brings to this campus leading and important voices uh, on critical questions. We could not have a more distinguished speaker today than today before, again, I get to say more about uh, the Secretary of the Navy, I do want to say a few more words about why the call to action is so meaningful and so important here. The Law School Veterans Legal Clinic is one step that we take to answer the call to action. We provide legal advocacy to indigent disabled veterans and help to train and we believe inspire the next generation of lawyers dedicated to the cause of veterans. Many of you in this room, whether you are in medicine, social work, science, government service, you're dedicated to this cause as well. Many of you are also veterans. Uh, some are in the active service, and some of you are family members of those who have served or are serving, and I thank you all for your sacrifice and for your contributions, because we all have a role to play. All of us, in the words of President Abraham Lincoln, must be committed to care for him or her, I don't think Lincoln said that, but I'm adding it, who shall have borne the battle. DAV, with whom we are so privileged to partner, uh, is an undisputable uh, le leader in this work, and through highly effective programs, through services, through advocacy, DAV works every day to empower veterans to lead lives with respect and dignity and meaning and also educates the public, and this lecture series is just one example. Uh, the great sacrifices of veterans and uh, the challenges that veterans face transitioning back to civilian life is something that everybody in this country needs to understand and needs to address. So we thank DAV for leadership and partnership and for this opportunity. So I want to recognize a few of our other distinguished attendees. Uh, we have Secretary Urena, from the Massachusetts Department of Veterans Services. Thank you so much. 
Uh, we have um, Andrew McCauley, the president and CEO of the New England uh, Center for Homeless Veterans. Really, really important work. And we have Coleman Nee, the former secretary of the Massachusetts Department of Veterans Services. And I think we may be joined later by Commissioner Giselle Sterling from the city of Boston's Veterans Services. The student leaders of the Harvard Law School Armed Forces Association, Nate McKenzie, Lauren Voss, Dave Heckman, Adam Eliano, these are, and other members of this association, first of all, I just say, you rock, you're amazing. True, true leaders on this campus, and I thank uh, you for your leadership and, and others uh, here in attendance. So, Secretary Mavis, um, you are Secretary of the U.S. Navy, you are our distinguished speaker, but first you have to hear me say why we think you're a distinguished. And it's not only because you are a graduate of the school, of this school from 1975, though something that we are very proud of. Uh, it is truly a remarkable uh, and accomplished um, biography of service. Born in Ackerman, Mississippi, uh, student first at the University of Mississippi, graduating summa cum laude, master's degree from Johns Hopkins, then uh, Secretary Mabus served in the Navy as an officer aboard the cruiser USS Little Rock. Then he came to Harvard Law School, which was a breeze after his service on the USS Little Rock. And he made his mark and he made uh, dear friends, including Bill Alford, who's right here. He graduated magna cum laude in 1975. Uh, he found some other things to do, but his call to service uh, became, uh, again, intense as he served as governor of Mississippi a distinguished governor, someone that everyone in the country watched uh, with great interest, and was indeed the youngest person elected to that post in more than 150 years when he took office in uh, 1988. He later served as ambassador to Saudi Arabia. He later became the uh, highly successful chairman and CEO of a manufacturing company, and yet he accepted the call to service again. When President Obama appointed him to be Secretary of the Navy in 2009, where he is the 75th United States Secretary of the Navy and the longest to serve as the leader of the Navy and the Marine Corps since World War I, he leads the world's only global Navy. He is responsible for a budget that is in excess of $170 billion. He leads over 900,000 people. I asked him before for some management tips, but I'm really serious. I, you know what you're talking about. And his travel schedule alone is, is extraordinary. He's traveled over 1.1 million miles. He's visited over 140 countries and territories in 48 states. He's visited with sailors and Marines who are deployed and stationed around the world. He's traveled to Afghan Afghanistan alone 12 times in recognition of the service and the sacrifice of the sailors and Marines who were deployed uh, there and in other combat zones. Because of his singular leadership, President Obama appointed Secretary Mabus to prepare the long-term recovery plan for the Gulf of Mexico in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And then real management uh, technique was shown because it was a very effective plan. And in 2013, Secretary Mabus was named one of the top 50 highest rated CEOs in the country. And let me tell you, he was the only one in the government to be named on that list. Uh, please join me in welcoming this remarkable public service a servant and someone who brings great pride to this nation, to the world, and yes, to Harvard Law School. <laughs> Dean Minnows, thank you so much. Um, you who have such a, an amazing legal career and who, have, who has written and spoken about so many of the issues that face the people in this room and that face our veterans and face our active duty members. And you are exceptionally kind in that, uh, in that introduction. How many of your veterans are on active duty here? Okay. Well, 40 years ago, Dean Minnow said I was a class of 75. So 40 years ago, 
I was sitting as a 1L, Harvard Law School, straight out of the Navy. And it, um, it was a lot easier after the Navy. I mean, the, the school didn't go anywhere. Um, <laughs> you, you could wear whatever you wanted to. It, you could quit. <laughs> Nobody put you in jail. I, I, I'm a Southern politician, so I got to tell one story. Uh, it was the fall of my 1L year, and I was in the Navy under the Chief of Naval Operations, Elmo Zumwalt. And he was famous for z that he would send out. And he allowed us to have beards and longer hair. And so I took advantage of that and grew a beard in the Navy. Um, a friend of mine said it looked like I glued two squirrels to my face. But <laughs> the, he came and spoke at the law school. And so I went, and I was way scruffier then than I had been in the Navy. I, I had adopted some sort of Fu Manchu mustache, and um, I'd gotten a haircut a year before, whether I needed it or not. And I had my one pair of jeans on and my great coat from the Navy um, with the shoulder boards removed, but still had the gold buttons on it. And at the end of his speech, and you walked up to the microphone to ask questions. And most of the people who were asking questions were veterans. And when I got there, I said, uh, my name is Ray Mavis. I recently discharged as a Lieutenant JG um, in the Navy. He looked at me and he goes, no way. <laughs> <laughs> that was, uh, I just uh, christened a ship, the USS Zumwalt, and got to tell that story. So here's, here's my plan. I'd like to talk for just a little while about Navy 101. Those sailors and Marines or who have been in the, in the audience don't need this, but I want to talk to you about what your Navy and Marine Corps does. And then I want to talk about veterans and active duty and what we're doing, what we're trying to do. And I'd like to start out by talking a little bit about the deep connection between the Navy and our military and Harvard. One of the, I told Dean Men of this, one of the proudest moments of my time as secretary was when we brought in ROTC back to Harvard after an absence of 40 years, after we finally got rid of Don't Ask, Don't Tell and could bring it back in a fair and equitable way. But after only West Point and Annapolis, Harvard has the highest number of Medal of Honor recipients of any school in the nation. Four secretaries of the Navy have gone to Harvard Law School. Um, and if you look at the graduates and you look at the student body today at the law school, at the Kennedy School, undergraduate, you're going to find a lot of people who are either veterans or active duty working on a, an advanced degree. So the Navy and Marine Corps. What the Navy and Marine Corps uniquely give to our country is presence. Being where it matters, when it matters, being around the globe, around the clock, being at the right place, not just at the right time, but all the time. We get that presence and the ability to meet whatever comes over the horizon at us, whether it's high-end warfare, whether it's irregular warfare, whether it's humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, or whether it's working with allies and friends and training, by four other Ps, people, platforms, power, and partnerships. I'm going to save the people one to last. Platforms, our ships, our aircraft. Quantity has a quality all its own. On 9-11-2001, the U.S. Navy had 316 ships. 
By 2008, after one of the great military buildups in our history, we were down to 278 ships. In the five years before I became secretary, the Navy put 27 ships under contract. Not enough to keep our fleet from shrinking more and not enough to keep our shipyards in business. My first five years, we have put 70 ships under contract and we've done so with a smaller top line. We, we are, and we're doing it through some pretty simple things. Through some things they teach here and across the river at the business school, competition, fixed price contracts, multi-year buys. Um, the one example I'll give is we just, in the summer of 14, we signed the largest contract that Navy has ever signed for almost $18 billion to buy 10 Virginia-class attack submarines. These submarines are made in Groton, Connecticut and Newport News, Virginia. We make them in the oddest way possible. About half of each submarine is built in Groton, about half of each submarine is built in Newport News, and then they join them together. Uh, but they're coming in ahead of schedule, and they're coming in under budget. But when we signed this contract, because Congress allowed us to do what is known as a multi-year, so 10 submarines over five years, two submarines a year, so that the shipyard could hire workers, could train them, could buy materials and economic order quantities, we are getting 10 submarines, we're paying for nine. It's like having one of those little cards, you know, buy nine subs, get your 10th one free. <laughs> That's what we're doing. And we have not done this at the expense of aircraft. We're buying 45% more aircraft than we did five years previously. So our sailors, our Marines, are gonna have the tools that they need to do the job and to provide this presence. Power is energy. It's how we fuel our fleet, how we fuel those aircraft. If you wanna see how energy can be used as a weapon, just look at what Russia did in Crimea. Just look at what Russia's doing in Ukraine or trying to do in Western Europe until the oil prices fell so precipitously. One of the things I didn't want to do was to have that used as a weapon against us. In my, in my first couple of years, I was presented with several billion dollars in unbudgeted bills because the price of oil went up. And oil is a global commodity. We don't control it. And it, even in the Pentagon, it's hard to find an extra two or three billion dollars when you're not expecting it. So I came up with, uh, with goals for the Navy and the Marines. The biggest of which is that by no later than 2020, at least half of all our energy will come from non-fossil fuel sources. We're gonna be there on our bases this year. We're gonna be five years early getting there. And we're doing it for one reason. There's some great side effects. Better stewards of the environment, lower carbon emissions, climate change. But those aren't the reasons we're doing it. Those aren't the main reasons. We're doing it to be better war fighters. We're doing it to be better at what we do. A Navy ship is the most vulnerable when it's refueling. Marines in Afghanistan were losing a Marine killed or wounded for every 50 convoys of fuel brought in. That was too high a price to pay. Now when you when you think of Marines, you normally don't think of ardent environmentalists. But the Marines have been doing more of this than anybody. At the height of the fighting in Sangin, the battalion of Marines that went in were issued solar blankets, they're about this big, solar panels. They roll up, they weigh about a pound, pound and a half. And they used them to charge their radios, their GPSs, all the stuff that, that they carry. That saved the, a company of Marines, 700 pounds in batteries. And we didn't have to resupply them. And they didn't have to haul them. We've got SEAL teams in the field now that are right at net zero in both 
energy and water. They use solar and wind to purify water so they can stay out far, far longer. We'll be at the 50% in our fleet by 2020. And early next year, January, we're going to deploy the Great Green Fleet, which is a carrier strike group. The carrier is nuclear, which is an alternative energy. The ships and aircraft with it will be sailing and flying on a blend of biofuels and, um, <clears throat> and conventional fuel. We only have three requirements for biofuels. Can't take any land out of food production. It's got to be a drop-in fuel. We're not changing our engines. And it's got to be cost competitive. So far, even with the drop in oil prices, we're meeting all three of those, of those requirements. And I do get some questions, particularly from a few congressmen, one of whom said at a hearing, you're the Secretary of the Navy, you're not the Secretary of Energy, quit this. Why are you doing this? And I said, well, the Navy has always been at the forefront of energy transformation. We went from sail to coal, from coal to oil. We pioneered the use of nuclear. And every single time, every single time, there were naysayers that said, you can't do it. You're giving up something free, the wind, for something that costs money, coal. You're giving up all these coaling stations around the world for oil. There is no way you can make a nuclear generator small enough and safe enough to fit inside a submarine. Every single time they were wrong, and they're wrong today. As the Saudi oil minister, Zaki Amani, said one time, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. <laughs> it ended because we invented something better. Partnerships. As Dean Minna said, I've traveled a good bit. Uh, a little over 1.1 million air miles, 140 different countries and territories. And I do it for two reasons. One is to see sailors and Marines where they are forward deployed. Instead of waiting back at the Pentagon on the off chance, they may come by and see me. The second is to see our friends and our allies how can we work together? How can we be more interoperable? Those two partnerships are crucial, but the most important partnership we have is the one with the American people. The Navy and Marine Corps are America's away team. We never get a home game. And there are no permanent homecomings for sailors and Marines. We deploy equally as much in times of peace as we do in times of war. And so Americans, don't get to see their sailors and Marines very much at all. And part of why forums like this, but also organizations like this are so important, is to keep that connection in a democracy between those doing the protecting and those being protected, so that there's never a gap, so that there's never a distance between those two groups. And finally, Finally, people, we've got the best force we've ever had. But we've stressed it a lot. And it's dangerous hard work. I mean, think about it. The way it's been described, if you're a sailor, you're on a steel ship filled with fuel, high explosives, and electricity on salt water. Usually you're going somewhere fairly fast. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> if you're a pilot, you're flying at sometimes supersonic speeds, protected by a very thin skin of metal. And I'm not even talking about combat now. I'm talking about just the normal day-to-day -day stuff. And when you show how dangerous, just routine operations are. We lost a Marine pilot this week in England on his way back 
that were ferrying aircraft from Bahrain back to the U.S. He had already served his deployment. Bad weather, and he crashed, and he died. We ask, we expect these sailors and Marines to do these very hard, very complex, and very dangerous jobs in an excellent way, day in and day out. And we are rarely, if ever, disappointed. Right after the tsunami hit Japan, the carrier Ronald Reagan was passing by Japan. And we turned her in about two hours. She got there. And using the same targeting technique she was going to use over Afghanistan, she made sure the right things got on the right aircraft in the right order going to the right place. I got there. I stopped by the Reagan about three weeks later. And in a room full of admirals and captains, my briefers were a Lieutenant J.G. and a Petty Officer Second Class because they had run the operation. No organization, Dean, pushes responsibility down so far and so fast as the Navy and the Marine Corps or as the United States military in general. So it's important that we take care of our people, that we do things to try to lessen the stress, that we do things to manage this force so that we have it at this high level of effectiveness for a long, long time. So let me just talk about a couple of things we've done. First is, three years ago, I introduced something called 21st Century Sailor and Marine. And it was to put all the programs we had going on on a bunch of things, some good, some bad, in one place. And so we pulled together everything, things like educational benefits and family benefits, but also programs against sexual assault, programs against spousal abuse and child abuse, programs against alcohol and its abuse. And one of the things we found was that a lot of things cut across all these programs. Alcohol is one of them. Suicide, sexual abuse, spousal abuse, child abuse. Alcohol is involved a vast majority of the time in, in those things. So we're able to attack it. And I want to say one thing about sexual assault in the military. It's gotten a lot of press, as it should. It's a crime. It is a betrayal of a shipmate to another. And we got to fix it, and fix it completely, or the fabric that holds together our military will fray. I think we're doing a lot of good things. And we're seeing numbers of reports go up, and we're seeing incidents go down, but we're not there yet. And this is, this is zero tolerance. This is, no kidding, a crime. And it's one of the most serious things that we face in the military today. Once we pulled all those things together, sort of a one-stop shop, if you need help, if you need financial counseling, if you need legal services, if you need counseling, if you need help on the GI Bill or the tuition assistance program that we run for active duty, that's a place to go. Then in May, we rolled out a whole bunch of new sort of talent management initiatives. We, and this is in no particular order, culture of fitness. Get people to be fit all the time instead of just the semi-annual test. That, so we're doing spot tests on fitness now. 
we're, we're adopting the SEAL nutrition guidelines because the SEALs got it from Olympic trainers. We're, we're measuring we're measuring things in fitness now that actually have something to do with the job. We're trying to promote within the, the confines of the law that currently exist more on merit than on time in grade. We've, we've now got 5%. Commanding officers can promote up to 5% of the enlisted on merit. And if they don't use their 5%, it goes back in a pool and others, other COs can get it and promote more than 5%. We've, we're doing things like the career and admission program, which says you can take up to three years off to do whatever you want to do. Have a family, look after an elderly parent, get a degree that we don't see the military value, but you do. Now you owe us two years for every year you take off, but we're gonna roll your lineal number back so that you're competing against people from three years later. So that those folks who were on active duty while you were taking those years off, that's not your competition anymore. First person that went through this career intermission program. Happened to be a woman. She was promoted to captain, 06, and she was given major command when she came back. The problem that we had was, it was called a pilot program. Nobody trusted us. Nobody thought we'd keep going on it. Well, Congress in this latest National Defense Authorization Act took off the caps. So we can offer it to everybody now. I introduced a warrior scholar program so that you can, and the first recipient, we're gonna do 30 a year, first recipients in the Kennedy School here right now. Um, and I wanna say a special word about women. We don't have enough women in either the Navy or the Marine Corps or in the US military as a, as a whole. Navy's doing better than almost anybody else. Um, we're, we're at about 18% women. Naval Academy is almost 30% now and the new class is coming in. Still too low, still way too low. Because a place like Harvard, more than half the undergraduates and professional school are women. So we, we're doing things like the career and admission program. But in July, I tripled paid maternity leave from six weeks to 18 weeks. We were losing twice as many women three years to 10 years as men. And it was almost always the same reason, to have a family. The question is not why did we do it, the question is how come somebody else hadn't done it? No other services followed but we're already seeing some of the effects. And I'm getting anecdotal stuff, and emails and letters saying I was gonna leave. I'm rethinking that now. We're gonna save money on this, and we're gonna have a more ready force because every time some highly trained pilot or surface warfare officer or submariner quits, we gotta retrain somebody and it cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars to do that. And our force is not as ready when we have to, when we have to do that. I opened up every, every occupation to women. I made the decision in 2010, put women on submarines. And I gotta tell you, I made that announcement and nobody cared. I mean, nobody cared. A month later, the CNO announced no smoking on submarines and everybody cared. <laughs> We've just had this um, women in 
the, 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 the few closed um, specialties. That Secretary Panetta and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs Dempsey in 2011 said, we're flipping the presumption. Everything is open unless you request an exception. It's with the Secretary of Defense now, but I've been very clear. I'm not going to request an exemption. You set standards. You set high standards, and you stick with those standards. And then gender's irrelevant. If you meet the standards, you get to do the job. So it's we're moving toward a more inclusive, more diverse force. We've, in the late 40s, the military integrated. In the 80s, the military recruited larger number, started recruiting women into the normal active duty forces. We got rid of don't ask, don't tell. And now this is one of the last barriers that we have to overcome. A more diverse force is a stronger force. The more different kinds of viewpoints you have, the better your force. You don't want a, a homogenous force. You don't want a zero defect force. It's one of the reasons I thought it was so important to bring ROTC back here. And by the way, the day after President Faust and I announced this, I got a call from Yale, from Princeton, and from Columbia. And it's all back, and NROTC is back at those three schools as well. But we're also opened an NROTC unit at Rutgers and one at Arizona State. They're the most diverse campuses in the country. We need this diversity. We need different ways of thinking. And we need people willing to take risk and be innovators. When Gary Ruffhead was chief of naval operations, he kept a fitness report outside his door framed of a young officer who had run a ship aground. And he was court-martialed for it. And his defense was, look, I was told to be aggressive, to get in as close to shore as I could to support ground troops. That's what I did. And yeah, I hit something. It wasn't on the charts. I ran aground, but I'd do it again because that's my job, to be aggressive, to take those risks. He was exonerated. His name was Chester Nimitz. Imagine if we'd have had a zero defect force and said, ha, you ran your ship aground, go find yourself something else to do, you're out of here. War in the Pacific might not have been quite, had quite the, the timing or the result that we had. And now, finally, to veterans. First, thank you, DAB, for all that you do, for the homeless veterans, for giving them financial counseling, for job training, rehab. And one of the things we've tried to do is lash up much closer with organizations like DAB to deliver the services that veterans need. Now, I'm responsible for active duty and reserves, but everybody on active duty, everybody in the reserves is going to be a veteran one of these days. And so we've got to do a better job of making that transition and of keeping that connection. I mentioned the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Anybody who was discharged for being gay can get their discharge changed. We have something called the Board for the Correction of Naval Records, BCNR. It's what does this. It's the body that does this. It was taken about a year from the time you filled out your forms to the time you got an answer. So I moved everybody who was discharged for violating don't ask, don't tell to the head of the line. You, know, you ought to have a different discharge. It ought to be quick. It ought not to take you a long time. And we're reaching out because we weren't having many people asking. We're reaching out to 
things like the Lambda Fund and uh, LGBT organizations to, to let them know that we want to right this wrong and we want to do it expeditiously. We are, in today's warfare, and I, I write a handwritten letter to every family member of a service, a sailor or marine that we lose in action. I've written more than 900 so far. But one of the things that's happening is that in World War II, more than 40% of wounded died. By Vietnam, that was in the mid-20s, and now it's around 11%. But what it means is that people are surviving much larger and more awful injuries. And they're gonna need more rehab, they're gonna need more things, more assistance, more help. And so we're trying to reach that as well. Working with Harvard on two physical things. One is implants in the ear to restore combat hearing losses or military related hearing losses. And the other is synthetic biology so that a, a prosthesis connects in to the patient and can be operated through neurons and brain signals just the same way that the original piece of equipment, hand, leg, was. I got to shake hands a couple of years ago with a Marine who had lost his right hand in Iraq. The hand that he had was a cadaver hand. He could not tell until he pulled up his sleeve. Those sorts of things and the fact that thanks to the prosthesis, 200 of our wounded have gone back to their units and into combat. The first thing people ask, usually when they're wounded, is can I stay with my unit? And what we want to do is give them that choice, give them that opportunity. We're doing things for wounded warriors like wounded warrior battalions for the Marines, Navy Safe Harbor. They do pretty much the same thing. It's the non-medical stuff. It's how do you make that transition to civilian life? How do you go from the military to the VA? How do you get your benefits? How do you navigate this maze of governmental rules and organizations that y'all are doing so well here to help veterans. We're, you know, we hear about the jobless rate with veterans. We hear about homeless veterans. One of the things we're trying to do is basically hire them. We've hired 70,000 veterans since 2011. We hire about 35 wounded warriors a day into the Department of the Navy because they've got the skills that we are looking for. For everybody, not just our wounded warriors, for everybody, we've got transition programs. They start a year before you get out, whether that's four years or 40. And we take you through, they're called different things, but it's pretty much the same thing. You go to counseling, you develop a plan for when you get out, what are you gonna do? What, do you wanna go into education? Do you wanna get more education? Do you wanna get um, a higher level of education? How do you get your GI Bill? How do you apply to schools? Second is, if you don't want to do that, how do you get a certification? <clears throat> how do you get a career? We've got, um, we've got a lot of apprenticeship programs now with various unions. And we're 
people before they are discharged are going into these apprenticeships. We continue to pay them uh, as, they, as they transition. And finally, if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to just go do something different, we're going to pair you with mentors, with people who will pay attention to you after your active duty service is over with. So, Dean Minna said, we're big. We got a big budget. But we're not the best at doing this. But y'all are. Uh, people like DAV, people like the Wounded Warrior Project, people like the organizations here at the law school that are helping our veterans get the respect, get the benefits that they have so richly earned. And I'll end sort of where I started. When I was in the Navy, more than 40 years ago, it was a very different Navy and a very different country. It was hard to walk through Logan Airport. I was stationed in Newport, Rhode Island. It's hard to walk through Logan Airport then in your uniform without somebody upbraiding you for being in the military. It was the same all over the country. But today, America has learned to separate the warrior from the war. You can have your disagreements over the conflicts that we may be in, but not over the people who fight them, not over the people who are willing to raise their hand, not over that very small percentage of the American people now, much less than 1% who are willing to serve in uniform. There was a quote after the end of World War II that the people who fought them were willing to give their today for our tomorrow. That's what our veterans have done for us. They've allowed us to do things like this, to go to school, to have the country that we have, to have the freedoms that we enjoy. We owe them their todays as well. Thank y'all. Question, comment. Um, I've got a tradition. First question gets a coin. All right. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Appreciate it, Mr. Uh, Secretary. Uh, it seems as if there's been an unprecedented number of naval commanders particularly ship commanders that have been relieved of duty for misconduct in the last few years. I'm just curious if that is a catalyst for some of your management tweaks or if that is a result of some of your management uh, uh, changes. Well, first, it's a fairly small number, but the difference, the reason that you see those Navy commanders being relieved we announce it. We're the only service that does. When we relieve somebody, we announce it and we announce the reason that we've done it. Just like court martials. Every three months, we put out a sheet of the court martials we've had, what the charges were. If there was a guilty verdict, the name is there. If there was a not guilty, the name is redacted. But we let everybody know how our system is working. We've got about 1,500 commanding officers of various types. We relieve last year about 29. Fairly small percentage, but it's mainly for things like uh, a bad command climate, inappropriate relationships, alcohol. Um, and 
sailors under the command of any person have the right to feel safe, have the right to, to have a deep-seated belief in that chain of command. One of, the, one of the things I'm trying to do in our fitness reports is get some sort of feed input, not, not the only input, certainly, but some sort of input from subordinates as well as superiors. Because if you relieve somebody who's an 06 captain for a bad command climate for being abusive, things like that, somebody noticed that on the way up. That person didn't just start doing it. Last thing I'll say is that we've, we've found some people, and there's a, an ongoing saga called GDMA, so our Glenn Defense Marine Asia, that has in, ensnared some of our officers in corruption. Now, we found it. Um, we, it did not leak for three years, and we were the ones that identified the folks that were involved. We got the guy who was head of Glenn Defense Marine, uh, charmingly named Fat Leonard. Um, we, he didn't think anything was going on. We had an NCIS agent that was feeding him information. We gave the NCIS agent bad information, and um, Leonard Francis, his full name, showed up in California where we arrested him uh, and charged him. Now, you, we get bad press out of that, but I'd rather catch the bad guy and get bad press than, than the other way. But one of the things I've said, we've upped our ethics training, we've upped our, our uh, where, when you get it, how often you get it. If you don't know it's wrong to steal, you don't know it's wrong to take a bribe. You don't know it's wrong to divulge classified information for money. Ethics training ain't gonna help. You miss something at home. You just, I mean, you, you can talk to you blue in the face. So the only thing you can do there is just set up ways to catch people. To make sure that if you do that, we will catch you and we will go after you. Um, to the full extent that we can. Uh, sir, thank you for coming and speaking today. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the joint uh, fight strike, joint uh, fight striker, and and I wanted to know if you feel that one airplane meets the needs of both the Navy and the Marine Corps as well as the Air, uh, Air Force. It's um, the F thirty five, the joint strike fighter. Well, it's called joint. There are three different aircraft, very different aircraft. Uh, F-35A is an Air Force version. Um, it's, it's got a gun, for example. Nobody else has one. Uh, wings are different length, a little different shape. The B, which is the Marine Corps version, is a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, completely different completely different than the others. Um, and the C, the carrier version, also, you know, much, uh, had to put a lot more emphasis on landing gears because you got the tail grip, you're, hit, you're hitting that carrier over and over again. So it is called a Joint Strike Fighter. That was a notion behind the program, but it's really three different programs. Yeah, and yeah, it brings some really good capabilities. Uh, to the fight. Now, Marines have got it first because they didn't buy F-18s, the latest version. They didn't buy the E's and F's. They were waiting for the F-35. So they didn't have a backup. And their Harriers are a wearing out. We bought all the British Harriers when the British quit their aircraft carriers five years ago. And we're using them for spare parts, but it still won't take us very long. So the Marines have already, they've got their first squadron in action now. So the B is doing pretty well. Um, Air Force next, they're supposed to IOC initial operating capability next year, and the Navy is 2019. So we're, we're always the third service to, to get it. Um, it's late, 
it costs way too much. Uh, and I have said publicly to some chagrin among various people that it's going to be the last manned strike fighter aircraft we ever buy uh, because warfare is moving to unmanned. And this will bring some great capabilities, but, uh, but we need to be looking at the next generation. And we already have, a, we've already demonstrated you can land a, an unmanned aircraft on a carrier, you can tax it around the deck, you can take off. Uh, pretty amazing. Yes. Mr. Secretary, that was just a superb uh, talk, and I was taking notes. Um, I have two questions. One is, we are talking here about how leadership can be taught. And in fact, members of our Armed Forces Association have given me the best insight that it actually it helps to first learn how to follow, which is not something people actually do very much around here. But I would love your thoughts about uh, how you help the Navy. Uh, and the young people entering the Navy really learn to lead. The second is the TV show NCIS comments. <laughs> I'm, I'm hooked, I'm hooked. Well first, um, I was governor of the poorest state in the union. And every day I got up and went to work, there were about a thousand things I could do to make things better. If I tried all thousand, I was going to fail on all of them. And so one of the lessons I learned there that I hope I've adep adopted here is you've got to pick a very few things. And you've got to focus on them to the exclusion of other things that are important. And that's why I did the, the four things. So that's all I'm going to worry about. Now, I've got other decisions I've got to make. But, but those are what I'm going to focus on. And I'm going to talk about them every single time. Um, my chief of staff, who was my press secretary when I was governor, my chief of staff now at Navy, tells a story. When I was running for governor, I made the same speech every time. And it said government ought to do three things really well. Education, job creation, and protection. Protection was law enforcement, health care, things like that. When I won the Democratic primary, our field head of our field operations came to him and said, we need a new speech. And he said, why? We just won. And she said, well, I'm sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> the press is sick of it. Everybody's sick of it. And we just need a new one for the general election. And he said, okay, tell me the three things he says government ought to do well. She said, there's education. Education. She couldn't do the other two. And we didn't change the speech. And so every time I get up, I talk about the four Ps and what we're doing. But second is, why are you doing it? And I think that's the most important part on energy. We're doing it to be better war fighters. But explain it in ways that are important to people in their jobs. We have a crowdsourcing portal now that we're asking for ideas from the fleet. We will, if they're voted on, they're debated, they're voted on, and we're funding these, and we're rewarding people. Rewarding them with financial things, we're rewarding them with citations and recognition too. And you know, so reward success. When people do what you think they should be doing, let other folks know. And, and reward them. Um, those two things, I think, get you further than almost anything else. And finally, and this is hard no matter what the, whether it's academia, military, government, private sector, make a decision. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Make a decision. It may be wrong. If it's wrong, say it's wrong. Make another decision. But make a decision. Don't just endlessly debate what should be done or not done. And 
I've learned if you do those three things, more likely than not, you'll make some progress. People do not like change. They don't like change. It's human nature. I don't like change much. Uh, one thing I was going to mention, and this is a small thing, when I was talking about women. Women wear different uniforms than men in our military. If we ask another group, any other group, to wear a different uniform, how would that be received? Women wear different uniforms because of historical accident. When women joined in large numbers during World War II, it was to the auxiliaries. They were given different distinctive uniforms to, to differentiate them. I went to the first Army-Navy game. By the way, Navy owns Army and football just like Harvard <laughs> owns Yale and football. <laughs> um, you know, we've got 13 in a row. Right now. But the cadets from Army marched out on the field. And you couldn't tell male and female. They all had exactly the same uniform on. The midshipmen marched out. And the women had different hats, different covers. You could pick them out. So I started, uniform means uniform. And when you look out, I want to see United States sailors and Marines. I don't want to see male sailors and female sailors, or male, sa or male Marines, female Marines. And so we're changing uniforms. There's more blowback on that than I've ever seen in my life. But once the change is made, it's always been that way. And nobody, it, we made it at the Naval Academy first. Women hated it first year. But then as people who were coming into the Academy, given the new uniforms, and that's all they knew. By the time they graduated, they loved it. So I think there, there are three or four things, and that's about all you can do. Yeah. I think it's Gary. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. It's been a fantastic conversation. Um, my background's in the Army, um, Special Forces enlisted. And I'm curious to what degree that you, as Secretary of the Navy, uh, collaborate with the other secretaries. And if you encounter resistance in your priorities, or if, if it's more consensus driven? Um, well, I went to dinner last night with John McHugh, the Secretary of the Army, whose last day is tomorrow. Uh, he and I are exceptionally close friends. I, I like McHugh a lot. We both came up through politics. We're, we understand each other. We're almost exactly the same age. Um, Deborah James, the Air Force Secretary, and the three service secretaries meet on a fairly regular basis. But if you want to kill something in the Pentagon, there are two ways to do it. One is to say, we need to study this. It's gone. <laughs> Second, though, is to say, we need to do this DOD-wide. <laughs> we need everybody to do this. Then you go to the lowest and the slowest common denominator, and it takes you a couple of years to get anything done. Um, so while we share information, we try to share best practices. Um, services are very different. When combat's over, the Army and the Air Force tend to bring most of their stuff home and most of their people home and become more garrison forces. The Navy just doesn't do that. We don't reset like the Army does, or the Marine Corps. We reset every day. It's called maintenance. Um, and so there are very different, very different needs of the services. And DOD, the, we call it the fourth estate, has grown faster than the services, way faster. Um, and a lot of it is overkill. It doesn't give anything to the war fighter. 
you know, defense finance accounting service writes our checks, the checks for all the services. We tell them who to write it to. We tell them how much to write it for. Last year, we paid them $300 million to do that. For $300 million, I can buy another littoral combat ship. And we're doing the first audit ever. Nine out of 10 internal controls at DFAS are not effective. We may not get an audit, a clean audit, because of them. So you know, you've got to look at the services, and you do. You have to keep a very close eye on what we're doing, how we're doing it. People are beginning to take a, a, a closer look at the overall structure of DOD because so many times it just adds people and complexity and doesn't get anything to, uh, to Army or Navy or Air Force or Marines. And thank you for what you did. Uh, sir, thank you for coming. Um, you mentioned earlier the, uh, the Virginia class uh, program. Uh, and I know it's been very successful. Uh, my background's with surface warfare as well. And uh, I just we wanted to- We were called to targets by those guys. <laughs> I was an anti-submarine warfare officer, sir. I <laughs> got plenty of that. Um, but uh, I guess, um, what, what do you think separates a program like the Virginia class program from perhaps a littoral combat ship program or a Zumwalt class program, which uh, had significant cost overruns? And uh, again, I'm not fully informed anymore, but at, at least the, at the deck plate level, it was understood to come in with um, capabilities that were below expectations. And if there's a management technique to kind of avoid that going into the future. Um, well, the only thing I'll disagree with you there on is LCS did have those and doesn't anymore. When I got there, they were costing about $800 million a ship. Today, they're costing about $350 million a ship and with better capabilities. The difference is in, in any of these programs, and the only one that we haven't driven down the cost, the only shipbuilding program are the carriers because we were just too far into the first carrier, into the Ford. And all we could do is try to play catch up. Um, now, the Kennedy, the next one, um, we've taken a lot of the lessons learned. It'll probably cost a billion and a half less than, uh, than the Ford. It's, it's a few of the things I mentioned. Number one, have the requirements. Uh, and one of the things in the NDAA that John McCain put in is the services ought to have a lot more say in the requirements early. But have the requirements right. Have the technology mature. If you've got some new gee whiz technology that comes along, put it on the next ship or the next block of ship. Don't try to force it in there. Don't di design a ship while you're building it, which Sounds simple, <laughs> pretty straightforward. That's not the way we built the Ford. We were building away on that thing before the plans were, were ready. That's just a dumb way to build a ship. <laughs> um, do some basic business stuff. Firm fixed price contracts instead of cost plus. <coughs> because the shipyard has no incentive on cost plus to hold down cost. Do block buys or multi-year buys. We owe shipyards certain things. We owe them finished plans, stable plans. You know, don't keep changing them. Mature technologies. And a notion of how many and what kind we're going to buy over the next five years. In return, they owe us some things. They owe us the infrastructure investments. They owe us the job training. And every ship or aircraft of exactly the same kind ought to cost less than the one before it because there ought to be a learning curve there. Uh, I'm really proud of LCS now, or I renamed it the Fast Frigate because it, it really does have frigate-like designs. And um, I was also a surface guy, although I was in so long ago we didn't, we didn't have the designate. I was just a black shoe sailor.
But they've given me one since I got this job. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. To the extent you can, could you speak to China, to the construction of the artificial islands in the South China Sea, the talk about a carrier being built, and the emergence of a blue water navy? Sure. Now, Bill Alford is way more qualified to talk about China than I, I ever am. Um, but obviously, China is building their navy. Uh, they're increasing both in capacity uh, numbers of ships and in capabilities. Um, our desired outcome, the thing that we are trying to work toward, is that China ought to be a responsible country of its size. It ought to help protect freedom of navigation, freedom of the seas. I'll make an argument, I think it's the right argument, that the Chinese economy is doing as well as it is today because of the United States Navy. Because we've kept the sea lanes open for everybody, unique in history. Because before, it was only when you had a dominant Navy, it was only the people flying your flag or your ally's flag. We've kept it open for everybody. Um, what they're doing in um, Laconia Shoals and the Spratleys um, is pretty provocative. It's clearly outside their territorial waters, although they claim it's, it's in there. It follows nothing of international law. And I think it's important that Admiral Harry Harris, who's Pacific Commander, head of Pacific Command, uh, said it over and over again, we're going to sail where we need to sail, we're going to fly where we need to fly to us, keep that. From and the main reason we're doing that is to keep the status quo from changing, um, to, to make sure that it's not, what's the term, adverse possession. Uh, <laughs> in, uh, in that part of the world. Um, we've also made it clear that these, the, the islands that the Japanese claim, that the Chinese also claim, that they come under our defense agreement, that uh, under Article 5 of that agreement, we will go to Japan's aid uh, if there's a, something there. We're trying to make sure that accidents don't happen that can, um, that can escalate into bad things. They have one carrier now. Uh, it's an old Ukrainian carrier. It took them about 10 years to get it to sea. They're building a carrier. They're, they're building submarines. They're building service combatants, and they're pretty good at it. Now, having said all that, I'd rather be where we are than where, where they are as a Navy uh, right now. But, uh, but it's a, there's always going to be something until the happy day when we, we don't need <coughs> things like this to, uh, to either defend ourselves or, or our friends. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, you talked about how fewer than 1% of the American population currently serves in the military. And uh, it's one of the collateral effects of having the all-volunteer professional force, and we have the best force that this country's ever seen or that the world's ever seen, but fewer and fewer Americans know anyone in uniform or anyone who knows anyone in uniform. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the what the military should be doing to close that civil-military divide and what we should be doing as informed citizens and vets to be doing that as well. Well, I think one thing is things like the Armed Forces Association here, um, things like ROTC here that may not be a lot of people, but you see uniforms on campus, and you've got a, an 06 who has an office here, and you've got a senior chief who has an office here, and you see those uniforms on campus. Uh, it's the first time in a long time that's happened. Um, we try in a lot of ways, and I'll just talk about Navy and Marine Corps. We have fleet weeks like we do in Boston. We have Navy weeks for inland places. Um, 
one of the great privileges I have is I name every ship in the United States Navy. In fact, I'm naming the USS Massachusetts tomorrow. Um, well, I'm filming it. It's going to, but we learned sort of by accident the best place to name ships is at ball games. You got tens of thousands of people, and we were naming them at state capitals or city halls, and just sort of by accident we went to the Car a Cardinals game when I named the USS St. Louis. And we put a film up on the Jumbotron, and 45,000 people stood up and cheered the USS St. Louis. So I'm now maybe the only person in history that's gone to all 30 Major League Baseball parks and thrown out the first pitch. <laughs> <laughs> now it's fun. <laughs> but it's also, I've sworn in some new sailors and Marines, I've re-enlisted. Sailors and Marines, I've named ships, and it's one of the ways that we, that we connect the, the names themselves. Um, you know, connect to the American people. A Boston native, Thomas Hutton, I named a ship for him, Medal of Honor recipient for the Korean War. He's 94 years old, still going strong. Brought his brother and two sisters to the Navy ceremony. Thomas Hudner was a pilot that came off a carrier in the Korean War next to the first black aviator the Navy ever had. That was his wingman. His wingman was shot down, uh, crashed on the side of the mountain. He flew over and saw that he was still alive. Couldn't figure out what to do. So he crashed his plane next to him. Um, could not save him, but he stayed on that mountainside for a long time waiting to be rescued. When he got back to the ship, it was a real close call as to whether he was going to be court martialed for crashing his plane or <laughs> uh, put into the Medal of Honor. I'm pretty happy the Medal of Honor <laughs> But American heroes, American cities, states, American counties, um, those sorts of things. So I've named First ship I named was the Maker Evers after the Civil Rights leader who was assassinated in my home state. Um, I named one after Cesar Chavez. I named one after Gabby Gibbons, Congressman Lee Um Those names connect the American people to our Navy and to the values that we all should hold. But it's a danger. It's a danger that in a democracy, the warrior class gets separated from, from everybody else. And one of the reasons I push so hard for ROTC in places like this, where we were coming to homogenous force. Everybody was coming from the same places, from the same backgrounds. And we just don't have a strong force, and we do have that danger of separation. Hi, thank you, sir. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about your, your vision for the use of the reserve force and, and the value may, they might have, um, especially in the context of the, the cost of training um, you know, new officers that you had mentioned. We couldn't do what we do without the reserves. Um, Marines have about 40,000 reservists, Navy a little over 60 reserves. Um, and because of just what you said, we can put specialized talents in the reserves that we're not going to need day in and day out, but we are going to need a, a small number of them or some number of them at specific times. Now, we're able to, to, to keep people that have these very high level skills by going into the reserves. One of the things a career and mission program is trying to do and other programs is make it easier to move from active duty to the reserves and back if you want to. Uh, so uh, the Navy is also the only service we're not going down in people over the next five years, assuming the president's budget is adopted. Uh, we, we are 70,000 fewer sailors than we were in 2001. We've already made that drawdown. And so we're bringing so many new ships online. We're going to get above 300 ships again by 2020. We'll be at 306 by 2020. We've got to have 
certain skill sets, and we will be using the reserves. Not as much as in individual augmentee roles as we did during Afghanistan and um, Iraq, but, uh, but using them a whole lot. The short story I'll tell, I was in Patika province, Afghanistan, provincial reconstruction team being run by a Navy submarine reservist. You know, when he joined the Navy and fixed submarines, I don't think he expected to find himself in the mountains of Afghanistan, but he did. But that's how flexible our reserves are. One more? We'll call it a day. Thank you, Dr. John Faber, second year student here from uh, Franklin, Louisiana. Um, Is that right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Um, I wonder, I guess maybe building on the question about the U.S. as a Pacific power and the rise of China, um, maybe making it more broad, um, what keeps you up at night? What do you worry about? <laughs> if anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I don't want to sound arrogant. I, I've never had trouble sleeping. <laughs> but, but I will say this. I have three daughters, 25, 23, and 14. One, the, the 25 year old is a graduate of here. And uh, if anything would keep me up at night, <laughs> it's, it's, it's my family. But uh, we got a great Navy. We got a great Marine Corps. We, uh, I, I sleep pretty well at night, and everybody else ought to do too. So, again, thank y'all so much. For